Okay. Um, so, ladies and gentlemen, good morning and welcome to this uh, uh, session of uh, Best Practice Forum on uh, IoT, Big Data and Artificial uh, Intelligence. My name is Concettina Cassa. I am um, PPF um, co-facilitator together with uh, Alex Cominos and Michael Nexon. And we also Wim De Gezella, that is a BPF consultant of uh, IGF Secretariat. I want just to share a few information about the structure of the session. We have a welcome introduction session, and then we will have three more sections where we will discuss some opportunities that IoT, Big Data, and Artificial Intelligence can address to societal challenges. And then we will have another section on policy challenges that will be moderated by Alex Cominos. Then I now give the floor to Wim De Gezella from uh, uh, it's a BPF Consulting of AGF Secretariat. He will give us more information about the best practice forum. Okay. Good morning. Thank you, uh, Titi, for the introduction. And hi, all. I'm, like Titi mentioned, um, Wim De Gezella. I'm a consultant for this uh, best practice forum. I will give you a very brief introduction and I would like to focus um, on the simple question, what makes this session different than the other sessions um, around and on the agenda this week? And why is it called a best practice forum? Uh, it is one of four uh, best practice forums which are part of a kind of intersessional uh, program by the IGF and organized by the MAC. What does this mean? It means that the MAC uh, early on in uh, this year, uh, probably February, March, uh, picked out three or four, uh, four teams and said, it's, we see that there's really a lot going on, a lot of discussion, and a lot of best practices uh, are happening in different fields with different stakeholders. So it would be good to just focus on what's uh, going on, what are the policy challenges and what is, um, uh, is going on in different fields around uh, best practices. So that's also why uh, there is uh, a MAC member, uh, which is Titi, leading the, um, leading the team uh, and then supported by co-coordinators. One is uh, Alex and the other one is Mike Nelson. He could not... Um, be here today, but he's, uh, so he is following remotely and I'm sure that uh, later on you will hear his, uh, his voice. Uh, so specific for the best practice forum is also uh, they start working during the year, trying to come up with some, um, trying to define the, um, the issues that, are, um, that should be looked at, uh, then produce a draft document. You might have seen it or not have seen it that there is some draft um, report online. Uh, that focused on challenges, opportunities, and best practices. And also, this discussion today uh, should be seen rather as part of that process of bringing people together to focus on, uh, uh, on uh, best practices and on, to focus on exchanging uh, experiences uh, rather than other, other um, panels or other workshops that are more a panel discussion informing and getting feedback. So it's very important. Uh, examples and remarks that are given today uh, will be in the report and we will also do our best to um, let it feed into a final output document that will be uh, published uh, well, in, in a couple of weeks after the IGF. Uh, so that's also I think uh, why today you will see this and I think we see this uh, very much as a uh, discussion, a round table discussion, and not as, uh, as a really uh, workshop. So that also means I'm looking forward to have all the panelists uh, being active, uh, involved in the discussion, but I think, and I can speak for the, the coordinators, we are looking equally or even more uh, forward to uh, uh, input and uh, ideas, thoughts from the, uh, from the audience. Uh, that was the brief introduction, and I give it back to, uh, to Titi. I will uh, mo thanks uh, Wim. I will moderate uh, the um, just a moment the section related to the opportunities. Okay. 
Okay, so this session will try to debate uh, how the three technologies, Internet of Things, Big Data, um, and Artificial Intelligence can address um, societal challenges that otherwise would be more difficult to address. So we want to share uh, your views, your best practice, your user case uh, on uh, which application can combine IoT, Big Data, and Artificial Intelligence to help solving a problem that excites you most. This is a question that came from the survey. But we want to share, we want to debate to you, user case, best practice, your review on uh, how do you think uh, these three technologies can help to address more uh, societal challenges. And uh, we have uh, several speakers here. Maybe we can uh, start uh, with uh, David from Mozambico to share your uh, views about uh, this opportunity. You can just introduce yourself and then uh, share with the community your views. Thanks a lot. Thank you. Uh, good morning. Uh, I am Salomon David. I am from Mozambique. I work for the Communications Regulatory Authority of Mozambique. We regulate the, the postal and telecommunications sector. I am a researcher, and um, it's not common on a regulator to be hiring researchers from the university, but this is the case now. Uh, things are changing at a very rapid and fast pace, so we have to not only adapt, but also start doing R&D to be able to regulate uh, the telecommunication and, and postal sector. Although the postal doesn't move uh, at a very rapid pace compared to the telecommunication sector, um, we have been doing uh, research in IoT, big data, and and especially in, in AI and machine learning. Um, one of the 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 biggest problems that we have uh, natural disasters. Uh, they are very common in Mozambique. Every single year, at least for the months of February to March, we have one or two cyclones. Um, last year, we lost two big cities, two of our, the second largest city, the third largest city we lost during two, two cyclones. And we know that problem is cycle. It, it always will happen. And we, tr we are trying to get ready using, I mean, different ways and different technologies. One of them is IoT and big data. We are trying to combine both of them to be able to first uh, gather data about everything which is happening around the country, not only through satellites, but through IoT, putting buoys on the sea, putting drifters on the sea to understand how the current moves, uh, how the weather is behaving. Um, we are also putting stations around the country to be able to understand what is the exact temp temperature in, in one specific place in, in real time, because it's really difficult to to acquire all of this information, uh, store in a, in, a, in a database and be able to analyze what are different, different patterns and changes that happen, I mean, currently. So with all of this data, uh, at some point you think that you can um, analyze it quick uh, and give you actually information about what's going on, but then we realize that um, uh, we will get lots and lots of data that we have to start looking at big data and different patterns to analyze this big data. That's where the challenge comes. I mean, data that you harness from IoT when you store in a system, it is a lot of information. It is a lot of, of um, patterns. Uh, I mean, if you're measuring temperature, environment, uh, air pressure, air quality, and all of these things, at the same time, I mean, you get like tons and tons of, of data that you don't know what, what to do. So we are trying to, to find ways to analyze data from, from IoT, which is not being easy because there is not, not a straight pattern on how to do it. But after we have learned from the data, then we, we try to understand what we're going to do with it. If a disaster happens, what do we do with all the information that we have? It's not only the data from the environment, but also we working on telecommunication telecommunication sector, we have lots and lots of data that from from people, I mean from customers, from subscribers. Edicts, um, I would say which is not good, edicts were put aside during these two cyclones. Because when you have got tons and tons of data of CDRs from people and you need to understand where are they located, 
before the disaster and after the disaster, and to be able to to send disaster relief, uh, we had to leave the ethics aside and just trying to pinpoint where each and every device was before the disaster. So that's how we use big data now. Although we saw that you are trying to locate somebody because of a disaster, then you realize that the solution that you have developed is actually very, very dangerous because you can actually be able to understand where somebody was or, some, or where somebody is at any given time without needing to speak with a, with a mobile operator. So today we can, we can do that during disasters, but we, we understood that in the future we need to work in some serious regulation to avoid um, people to misuse such a tool. Uh, thank you. Thank you, David. Before to go to the next speaker, I want to introduce also June Paris. June Paris, it is uh, our uh, online moderators, and Marco Zennaro, that is our reporter. So then um, I can give the floor to Christine. So um, introduce yourself just a little. Thanks. Hi, everyone. Uh, good morning. And I'm very pleased here to be sharing this floor with all the distinguished experts and also uh, friends and uh, fellow stakeholders of UN who are concerned about this topic. Um, firstly, I uh, introduce myself. Uh, I'm from FIOT Open Lab, and I take care of business development, uh, specifically strategy, and also building up an international ecosystem. Uh, so what does this mean actually for, for us at FIOT? We are a non-profit platform that's uh, invested by a local research institute as well as uh, the government. And we are a neutral party and we tried out to do our best to help uh, this IoT AI uh, technology development to promote uh, these technologies in our community and as well as uh, set some industry standards to help because uh, what we see is that IoT applications are very diversified and even fragmented today. Uh, so regarding uh, this topic, uh, I think there are many important things uh, that I think David also mentioned, uh, such as uh, you know, f helping uh, to do this management of natural disasters, etc. So I bring uh, maybe some examples that FIOT Lab we have been involved in uh, to uh, help rejuvenate uh, local uh, rural villages that we see in the Fujian province, which is the southern part of China. So I think uh, why we want to do this uh, rejuvenation of these rural villages is actually uh, probably the, the first two uh, SDGs, okay? Uh, no poverty, no hunger. Uh, this is very difficult, clearly, because uh, it's, it's a global issue. Uh, we need uh, many efforts uh, from multi-stakeholders to make this happen. But uh, we believe at FIOT, we take one step at a time, uh, whether it's just promoting a small part of a technological advancement or helping uh, to these um, IoT, AI, and big data technologies we help to make it into a standardized model at a demo site, which we then can implement and help roll out uh, across to uh, other uh, provinces and cities in China. So that's what we are doing. So uh, I think something related to also what David said just now, um, in this uh, Fujian province, uh, also we, we experienced hurricane season, <laughs> lots of uh, flooding. And uh, in this uh, leasing village, which also I, I think we will see mentioned in the BPF white paper, uh, we have managed to use uh, IoT sensors and also uh, this um, to collect data. So we want to uh, collect the data in case of uh, when the, the water levels are increasing, we can have early trigger alarm to say that perhaps this region is gonna experience uh, flooding. So then uh, you know, we can trigger the emergency uh, teams to help the evacuation earlier. Because a lot of these areas are very rural, they are very far away. So maybe by the time they get news, it's too late. So we want to have this news early. And so we have to use a lot of uh, AI 
and also uh, algorithms to do this uh, early detection. Uh, the second one, uh, model that I want to also um, share today with all of us is uh, this. Um, we have a site also in Wuyi Mountains. It's a very scenic area. I highly encourage uh, to visit uh, if you can. Uh, we have a lot of land that are actually um, abandoned. It used to be very uh, popular for uh, planting certain crops. But later, I think um, it's abandoned because I think the younger generation they go to the village, uh, they go out from the village into the cities for um, you know better employment opportunities. So how do we help uh, to you know turn this uh, land into future sustainable use, or even to help the uh, existing farmers in the place uh, to continue, uh, whether it's to create jobs for them or to um, help with uh, this, uh, them to create a revenue and livelihood in this area. So we actually have, um, again, using a very simple, simplistic uh, IoT sensors to help uh, this, um, you know, checking to make sure uh, that we can turn these wasteland into fisheries. Again, this is very special because um, I think the local Chinese culture uh, not only, you know, they, they're not no longer just hungry, they want to eat fresh fish. So um, there's a huge demand for uh, fresh fish, and uh, clearly the population is so big. So how uh, we, we try to use uh, very um, simplistic uh, IoT technology and also um, IT-related um, techniques to help them uh, make better uh, farming practice for fisheries. And we also help them to have a remote monitoring so that the experts in the cities, who are the fish experts, can help to uh, inform and uh, tell these farmers you know, what to do, uh, how to, what's the best practice for uh, fishing, and uh, if there's any disease outbreak, how to manage them. So I, I just share these uh, very simple examples, and I think I leave the floor to other experts. Thank you. Thank you, Christina. I'll give uh, the floor to Raimond. Can you just introduce yourself? Good morning, everybody. And thank you for having me. Um, my name is Raymond Onoa. I am a research consultant with the regional think tank for the Global South, Research ICT Africa. And in the past year, uh, within the re uh, research, the regional academic network on IT policy, we've been focusing on developing policies, digital policies, with regards to artificial intelligence and other emerging innovative technologies across the region as they gradually begin to take uh, hold across the continent. And in the last year, uh, I, I particularly have focused on the issues surrounding data protection and privacy protection uh, with regards to harmonizing these policies and having a more critical front in dealing with some of the emerging risk and challenges that these technologies will pose. Why, this, why the convergence of AI, IoT, and big data has not gained much traction across the continent? There have been some few snippets and critical intervention points that they have provided in the region. As we know, uh, the digital revolution that these technologies bring has been promoted as arguably the greatest enabler for sustainable development by pooling of data, making real-time information available uh, in critical times. The convergence of these technologies can assist in critical areas such as health, agriculture, and environment, not just enabling technical scientists, but also policymakers to better understand these issues and design policies and finding new ways to make progress on the various dimensions of the SDGs, not just making progress, but to have data to be able to analyze them, to understand how much progress is being made, in what area, and who and who has been covered, and who is left out or included or excluded in that development. Just focusing on uh, the SDG 3, <coughs> uh, with regards to good health and well-being, I'd just like to paint a small story of the critical critical intervention point with regards to uh, this, the convergence of these technologies that is displayed uh, within the developing economy space. Uh, and that is with regards to the Ebola outbreak 
in West Africa around uh, the late 2013. So I'll just say a short story about that, uh, just to paint that picture. So when this uh, outbreak uh, hit West Africa in the late 2013, the world was literally caught unprepared. So the consequence was that there were over 30,000 cases that led to approximately 11,000 people being dead, and a lot of billions of dollars were lost across the global ecosystem. And so information, information, uh, was very critical to the fight against this scourge, both for the respondents and also was needed for timely data about the disease spread and for the communities who needed access to information with which they could protect themselves and their loved ones. But as we knew it then, and clearly the technical, the institutional and the human systems required to rapidly gather, transmit, analyze, use, and share Ebola-related data were not sophisticated or robust enough to support the response in a timely manner. Real-time data, uh, as I said, is very critical in trying to fight some of these uh, challenges when they happen in society. There were unexplained peaks and valleys in Ebola case counts and dramatically differing forecasts of the disease's potential spread and these complicated relief efforts and raised important questions about why it was so difficult to track the disease. Although digitized data and information flows did not constitute the norm, especially within the region, they did contribute meaningfully to the Ebola outbreak response in specific instances and introduced both quantitative and qualitative differences in data and information flows in the response when used for real-time data and information exchange between the central ministries of health and the frontline health workers. Uh, a critical intervention that was developed at that point in Liberia was the deployment of um, the mobile phone-based communication system that was called M-Hero. This was launched by the National Health Ministry there in consortium with partners that included UNICEF, Intro Health, and K4 Health. This enabled real-time connection between, uh, between the central ministry staff and the frontline uh, health workers. And the two-way uh, real-time uh, information exchanges between these, using basically uh, the mobile phones, like we know across the developing countries, the key uh, connectivity platform is the mobile phone, and this hel helped the, the, the workers and the interventionists to correlate and gather information in real time about the scourge, and the platform allowed them to receive critical information in real time and helped to a very great extent in fighting the Ebola scourge. So this is a critical example of how even though uh, the convergence of these technologies have not gained so much uh, foothold in the developing world, but they are already solving challenges, especially with regards to health and well-being. Thank you. Thanks, Raymond, for uh, your contribution. Mm -hmm. Then I will give the floor to Olivier Bringer from the European Commission. Thank you, Titi. Olivier Bringer from the uh, European Commission. I'm working in the digital department of uh, the European Commission called DigiConnect, and I'm in charge of internet governance policy and also investment in uh, internet uh, technologies. So first, b before uh, replying to your question, Titi, I would like to say that, uh, I mean, we really support the, the process of organizing these best practice uh, fora. The idea to have intercessional work, to discuss with the community and to come to some sort of uh, concrete uh, output is, is very, very good, I think, for the way the internet governance, uh, internet governance works. Having said that, on the point uh, of uh, how IoT, Big Data, AI address societal challenges, I would like to make a first remark, which is that these three components are really the key pillars of the digital transformation. Um, if you think about the digital transformation of healthcare, if you think about the digital transformation of the mobility sector, what are the key elements of that? It is IoT, it is sensors, it is connected objects. It is the data which is shared between those sensors, between people, and between machines which are able to process and make sense out of the data. And increasingly, it will be uh, artificial uh, intelligence. Um, so we invest, of course, a lot into these, uh, into these domains, both on the what I would call the policy and regulatory side, and we'll certainly come back to the 
uh, for example, the, the framework we have put in place around uh, data protection uh, or what we have done around the free flow of data uh, and, and several other uh, um, regulatory initiatives. But we also, um, uh, we also invest a lot in those technologies uh, under our current research and innovation program and even more under the next uh, budget of the European Union. So I would like to, so there would be hundreds of examples. I will take only one, uh, which is called the IoT large scale pilots, uh, which are pilots, uh, as, uh, as the name says, uh, where we test these technologies in specific use cases. So there are a number of use cases we have, we have chosen. Uh, one is, for example, agriculture. Another one is active and healthy aging. So how to allow with sensors in a house, with connectivity, uh, to um, uh, support um, elderly people to stay uh, at home. One on smart cities, and of course there, uh, there are a lot of uh, uh, connected objects which can help make the city uh, more livable for, for the citizens. E-health is also one area, and transport. And this, what is interesting with these uh, large-scale pilots is that it allows to test technologies of different levels of maturity, further develop the technologies, but also have a link it to the use cases, link it to how the technology can, can be used and provide um, benefit to the people in the different sustainability uh, uh, areas. Uh, and it allows also to um, uh, discuss and um, uh, raise questions about what should be the framework for these technologies to be properly implemented. So it raises issues around how do we manage the data. I found it very interesting, for example, the, the first example of, uh, of David, uh, there is a disaster. How do we manage personal, uh, personal data? Uh, how do we use geolocation data in exceptional circumstances? And in the future, how do we use them in normal circumstances? So when you implement the technologies, you ask yourself these, uh, these uh, questions and that will feed into the policy making uh, process. So I think that's why the, this type of uh, large scale pilots are, uh, are interesting. And then another uh, point which also I find interesting is um, a new area of uh, reflection which is called collective intelligence. So collect we, we are uh, with social networks, with uh, the, the mobile phone that we have in our pocket, we, ha we have a huge uh, connectivity among people, and people are intelligent. They have views, they have access to knowledge, and they are, they are willing to share it. We have sensors with us in, the, in our mobile phones, in our houses, which provides useful information. So how can we use all this useful information to improve the way, for example, cities are working, to improve public transportation in a, in a city? Um, to improve uh, healthcare, for example. And, and this is an area where we will, uh, so we are starting to think how we could invest in, and we will invest certainly uh, uh, in the next, uh, in the next, in our next um, uh, work programs uh, in, in research and innovation, see how we can exploit these, uh, this collective intelligence to serve uh, sustainability uh, challenges. Thanks. Then uh, I will give the floor to uh, Evelyn. Okay, thank you very much. And um, hello, hello to everybody. Thank you for having me here. So um, I'm a senior researcher at the Institute of Social Ethics at the University of Lucerne, Switzerland, where I'm writing uh, my habilitation, habilitation in German, on the um, risks and opportunities of technology on peace and conflict. So um, my background is like um, both in peace and conflict research, but also ethics and human rights. And I'm also affiliated as a research associate at the um, Center for Technology and Global Affairs at the University of Oxford, where I'm coordinating a new program called Global Peace Tech which is very similar as my own research at the University of Lucerne. Basically, um, also in a way similar, as Olivier said, like trying to launch uh, different like pilot projects in a, in a sense, which uh, examine specifically not only the risks, 
that new technologies pose to peace and war, but also the, like trying to leverage the opportunities. And these are very diverse, I mean, these can be very diverse, so to say. So this is like kind of a network which uh, assembles different researchers from different fields. Some of them, they're um, like addressing the more kind of direct causes of war, means like direct violence. Others are more in the socioeconomic area or in the cultural area as well. So um, because like when we think about uh, peace or violence, it's like peace is not only security, but it's a bit broader also with socioeconomic and development issues and so on. So, um, like the examples that I was thinking of, well, one was actually in the field of humanitarian aid and conflict uh, crises, but we are already heard quite a lot in that domain. So, um, I'm going to think of two other examples, which, I mean, when we think about best practices, maybe just as a side comment, I think it's important first to think about what technology does, in a way. And I think there are two big things, or two big opportunities that technology present. One is that it simply um, like makes already existing solutions in a way more efficient and more effective, means it uh, reduces the, frictional, the frictions, the transactions costs. So we can do things that we have been doing so far, like crisis response, more efficiently and effectively. On the other hand, however, I think it's also interesting to see that technology really changes the allocation of effective power. With that I mean like social power, economic power, political power. So this on the one hand might be a risk because it concentrates power even more in the hands of a few, but it's also a huge opportunity to actually use this disruptive force of technology to empower people that have not had that much power in the past. And there I can give the example um, of an initiative at uh, Oxford, which is called uh, Global Women's Narratives Projects. And um, so what is being done there is that the, the narratives of women living in conflict zones are collected. And that is a lot of data. I mean, um, different countries, different narratives. So what we are thinking right now is to connect it to that uh, Global Peace Tech program, project to make it um, searchable with uh, AI and actually to be able to search for certain patterns in that database. And I think that's interesting because it gives a voice to women in conflict regions that are often just portrayed as the victims of wars, but it makes them like more active advocates for peace because they're getting their voice hear heard. And it, also, it would also allow, like, if you think of what kind of patterns could you actually search. Something which I always find very kind of sad is that we tend to look at the bad examples, especially when it's about peace and war, like what has gone wrong, like all the differences of ethnic and religious origin and why people fight with each other. But I think it's important to look, same as with the best practice form, on, on good examples as well. And then you could, there you could search, or that is a bit the plan, for like patterns of what do we actually share. Like what do these women share across religious or ethnic or rural, urban, like different cleavages that exist in society. What do they share? And if you could get like the message across that no matter actually like on which uh, part you live in a way, like your life world is quite similar, I think there would be a pretty strong message that you could build on. So like creating the right mindset for peace in a way. And then, um, yeah, I mean, that is the basic exam. Maybe I can just like give a short, short idea, which is not done yet, but I think it would be a really huge and nice opportunity. Is like in the past I've done field research in uh, Ethiopia on water politics. And I remember that uh, like this kind of conflict setting is very challenging with Egypt and uh, Sudan and Ethiopia and who gets like how much water for what purpose. I think it would be great to look into that, what I, AI can do to that, because you have like different um, kind of usages, like you have drinking water, Ethiopia is like into electricity production, Sudan is into agriculture, Egypt is into tourism. And it's very conflictive who gets how much water. And at the same time, it's very dependent on weather conditions and seasons. Like if the agriculture needs the water, it needs it in a way. So like just to kind of 
Um, and because, of course, like everybody always would claim that uh, we have the right solution and we have the priority. Mm -hmm. And if you have like a more kind of neutral maybe system, I'm not sure if it's neutral, but if the trust would be there, that that AI system would be working well, I think it would be really kind of a good example of um, where where these new digital technologies can also help to prevent future conflicts. Okay, thank you, Evelyn. We'll start now by Emanuela Girardi. Emanuela, do you want to introduce yourself a little bit? Yes, sure. Hi, everybody. Thank you for inviting me. And I'm Emanuela Girardi. I'm from Italy. I'm part of the uh, AI expert team of the Minister of Economic Development in Italy who designed the Italian National AI Strategy, which hopefully will be soon released <laughs> because it's there, but they, they haven't published it. And I founded a, um, an association called POP AI, Popular Artificial Intelligence, to bring artificial intelligence to people because uh, artificial intelligence, it's really uh, like a game changer, like everybody says, it's really disruptive. But people, I mean, they really don't know exactly what AI is, uh, even if they are using it every day from Google Map to Netflix to Spotify and all the application. And I think that to be able to exploit the huge benefit and the opportunities of AI, we really need to explain to people what AI is, uh, which are the benefits, and which are the risks as well that AI, I mean, is embedded inside it. Um, referring to the, the best practice, um, I mean, you already mentioned lots of things, so I think that uh, a couple of interesting things are still in the, um, to me, I mean, the, the main uh, probably opportunities are in the health system, like Olivier already said, and also Raymond, and um, they mentioned it. I think that one thing that it's very interesting is in the drug discovery process uh, that AI could bring huge benefits. I mean, not only because uh, it, it reduces a lot the time to market, I mean, I'm analyzing this huge amount of data and with AI algorithm, machine learning, uh, neural network. So it can reduce the time to market of new medicine and new therapy. And I think that uh, the best thing is that, uh, I mean, it can reduce the cost as well. And this probably will make uh, new therapy and new medicine available uh, to more people around the world. Uh, so also in, uh, in Africa and in other countries where probably it's more difficult to access to new therapy. And it's very, ex uh, I mean, it's very expensive, like probably also the Ebola, I mean, it was very, ex uh, very expensive to bring it to the vaccination to, to everybody. So this is one, be one opportunity. And um, the other one, I think that it can help us a lot uh, in uh, increasing accessibility and uh, inclusiveness uh, for people with disabilities. Uh, and this is, uh, I think it's something very, very important because I, I recently read a research that said that there is 70% of people that are kind of suffering a sort of disability, which can be temporary. Like if I break a leg, I have uh, a mobility disability, a temporary mobility disability. And in this sense, so everybody can experience it, I mean, from very severe one to, I mean, very like temporary or not severe ones. And um, I think that there are some areas of artificial intelligence that can be very, very useful. For instance, I mean, we, we don't have to think about self-driving cars, which will probably come in a, in a while. So we'll help a lot of people with a physical disability to increase the mobility. But also if we think about people with uh, visual or hearing or cognitive uh, impairments or disabilities, and we think about uh, the AI technology like voice recognition, for instance, uh, I mean, we can help these people. And I think that this is what is really important for uh, these kind of technologies uh, that can, can, they can help amplify human capabilities. And this is really, I mean, probably to me is one of the, the best thing that AI can do really. And uh, if we think for instance about uh, some app that can transform the environment uh, for a, people, a person who cannot see in a kind of a auditory experience. And, and this is really something that can, I mean, can, you can make somebody listen who cannot hear or see that who cannot see. And this is something really, really important. So I think that this uh, thing that AI can really amplify human capability is one of the best practices that we can use. Thank you. Uh, after. So thanks a lot, Emanuela. And then I will give the, the floor to Bruna. Thanks, Bruna. Thank you very much. Um, my name is Bruna Santos, and I am the advocacy strategist for coding rights. We are mostly a Brazilian NGO that has been working on the field of feminism and 
data protection and the inter intersectionality between those subjects. Um, back in Brazil, I guess, I, I, I'm just gonna start like doing this life kind of setting the scene for Brazil, because I think um, it's important to mention that we don't have uh, a national AI strategy so far, and we just approved our data protection bill. So we're kind of in the, still at this very exploratory situation. But um, um, yeah, not going on to the pessimistic kind of approach to those things as well, but then I'm gonna mention um, one very good example that we have back there. It's called Serenato de Amor, which is pretty much Love Serenade, the project, which was um, a way for um, us to have more space. And, and after the, the approval of our access to information bill, was a way of um, showcasing and disclosing some of the suspicious, um, suspicious buys or the suspicious things our representatives would do. So in every single case that um, the this AI would assess the, the expenses of the representatives, which is called Rosie the robot, and then whenever Rosie sees um, a suspicious um, kind of expense, she just tweets about, and so far, um, Rosie has managed to get um, reimbursement for um, expenses with alcohol and expenses with parties and even like cases in which Brazilian representatives were um, drinking in Ve Las Vegas. So this would be one very interesting approach so far um, and one very like, this is kind of my friends and then um, this is one project that I'm really proud of. Um, important to mention that Rosie was inspired in the Toblerone affair, so a Swedish politician was pushed to resign after being caught pay paying for a simple Toblerone cho chocolate with public money. So that was kind of the, the, the inspiration for Rosie. Um, and then um, thinking about a second project and thinking about a kind of slightly more sad but, any, but also really good important um, initiative was a project called Birmingham D. Birmingham is a Brazilian startup that um, back at the beginning of the year, maybe last year, um, when the whole Brumadinho disaster went on, he was trying to locate some, trying to cross the, the cell phone signs from the victims and trying to locate them. So whenever the disaster happened, um, a lot of startups, they went up together um, to the region in, in trying to locate um, the victims and, and to better assess how the situation was. And I guess I can stop around here and then we can move on. And then uh, uh, we can go to the next section that uh, actually is on policy challenges, should be modernity by Alex. Um, I, I will start, I don't know what you suggest because Alex had the problem, she went away, I can start and then he will come. So, um, uh, we actually have three policy sections that we have identified inside the... Uh, oh, Alex is coming, okay? <laughs> okay, so we're just starting to explain the, the policy challenges section. Okay. Okay, so sure. you can go. Sorry about that. Yeah. Uh, mm -hmm. Actually, this one report to go straight to the panel. We go straight to the panel. Yeah? Oh. yeah. Okay, hi. I'm Alex Komnenos. I'm a coordinator for the BPF. And there's, yeah, a number of policy challenges that arise from AI. I think the uh, big data and Internet of Things, and I think the list is increasing as we speak in terms of uh, the policy research and the uh, policy making. But we've managed to, to split it up into themes uh, regarding... Uh, yeah, we managed to split it up into themes uh, in the best practice forum, and our policy challenges relate to use and uptake. So in order to have AI be beneficial for the economy, society, and in our personal lives as computing users, we do have to promote use and uptake of AI that in, uh, involves stimulus economically and um, in society as well. And then the big issue is trust. So um, trust needs to be built uh, by, ap by the applications, by developers, by society, and users also need to trust AI. So uh, I think there's 
two elements to that is making sure that the AI is, is beneficial, but the second element is also obviously uh, an educative element if there's misconceptions about what I, AI is and um, if, yeah, for example, data protection, if you're not informed about what's happening with your data, you can trust that, you can trust AI, big data, and IoT for no good reason, but uh, if, yeah, if you don't know why you can trust it, then you can also distrust it for no good reason. Um, and then the, the last is data-related challenges. So IoT creates data, AI needs big data. Um, the, the, we, we need data sets to work with, data sets that are useful. So, so the, there's questions about the, the generation of data sets, the sharing of data sets, but also about um, the custodianship of data. So, yeah, if I could move to the panelists to identify policy challenges and examples from their regions, countries, or personal experience. Okay, we want to hold the same uh, round? We want to, to, to start with Eric? Yeah, we can do the same round. Okay. Thank you. Um, um, I would say that in Mozambique we have started drafting the um, data privacy law for the telecommunications sector due to what we have experienced in the past. But we are, we are part from the government which, um, it's not the government, but it's part of the government which is a bit complicated nowadays to be a, a regulator because you not, you not only defend the interest of the government, which may change, but you also defend the interest of the society at the same time. So we take a more cooperative approach when we are trying to do, or when we are doing regulations and laws, um, such that we have, in most of the laws that we are producing and the regulations, the EV participation of the civil society. Because that's the only one way you can have a win-win situation. I mean, when you approve that document, Everyone is well aligned with what you have approved. So um, for the data protection uh, law, for example, I mean, there is a large concern from the public about um, illiteracy. I mean, if even in, in countries with high level of literacy, uh, the small letters in the contract, people just look at them and sign. Imagine in our context, I mean, people start getting concerned about who gonna have access to my data? How they gonna be handling my data? Um, if this won't gonna be used against me, can at any point I opt out? Can, I mean, how this whole process will be done? So even to create a platform for that also means that there will be more of your data about where you opt in, where you didn't opt in. Uh, for example, the banking sector, they want to have access to for example, the location of your mobile phone. If you're doing a transaction online from Barbados, for example, they want to know if you are actually in Barbados. They want to go to the telecommunication infrastructure, know the location of your phone or the last location of your phone and decide, was it him or not him? If the phone is in, in Mozambique and your card is being transacted in Barbados, they'll just send you a message. That's how they do normally. But because of frauds, they want to be a little bit more sure so that they don't have the customer coming and complaining. So, I mean, they want to have access to that information without having um, specific uh, regulation for it. But, I mean, it's to protect the customer, but at the end of the time, the customer doesn't want to give that information. Uh, they don't know how you're gonna be using it. So it becomes a roller coaster of discussions about several things and specific uh, things about AI is that the regulator have created a small AI just to analyze bonus promotions in the telecommunication sector. And then we allow the AI to send messages to, to some specific phone numbers that we have contacted them, tell them that they'll be addressed by, by an SMS which is created by an AI, telling them what is the best package and bonus or promotion that they have to adopt from each and every operator you have to see that 40% of the people who received the SMS, by the moment they received the SMS, having a specific promotion or bonus from, from any operator, just go straight on and buy it. They don't even analyze it. 
And we realized that the, the AI is good at looking at how much you spend at the end of the month on your phone, uh, trying to see what is the best uh, package that you can, you can actually use in the market. And they are like very quick at deciding. And then, of course, we put somebody to verify before it sends the message. But it, it brings several changes to the market that perhaps even to regulate them, we need to think before before doing the regulations. Like, even if we do understand how the technology work, how the AI work, if we over-regulate, the market won't be able to grow. If we do not regulate, I mean, it'll become a mess, and then we will have to become reactive just to pass bills just to solve specific problems. So we, we, we took a step back and look at where we want to be in the next 10 years when, it's come, when it comes to big data, AI, and IoT. I mean, IoT generates a lot of data, but what people don't understand is like radio communication, what decides how IoT is going to be in the next 10 or 15 years. The World Cup of radio communication is known as the WRC. It's not the World Cup of soccer. It's the World Cup of IoT. That's where all the decisions are being taken. I will give you an example. There is a frequency band called 868 where LoRa actually happens to, to be used. In that, it says that each device can only transmit 1% of the time, meaning you cannot be transmitting all day. No, you have to transmit only 1% of the time. But for me, which I don't have a very big city or dense cities with so many devices, 1% doesn't make any sense. I cannot track a bus with 1%. I'll have to spend a lot of money to track the location of a bus and give information to somebody how many minutes the bus is far away from you. That doesn't make any sense for me. For my rural areas where there is nothing in there transmitting, 1% is zero. I don't need that. I need more than that. So we are trying to change that piece of regulation not in Mozambique, we need to change it outside because we are from region one. So it means we have to discuss all of this with Europe and other African countries. We cannot just on a whim decide that we don't want 1%, we want calculations told us that 17 to 20% is really good for our region. But you see, you cannot just on a whim decide how to change things because whatever you change when it comes to regulation, not only changes your market, but also influence how you operate on a region. Thank you. Thank you very much. I think that's an interesting perspective on the, the challenges of regulation. Um, and uh, so that's a good introduction. Uh, in terms of the three themes, maybe we can go to um, Christine Tao next, and we can discuss uh, use and uptake of, of, of uh, IoT, big data, Internet of Things. What, what policy challenges are there in terms of use and uptake? what works, what needs to be regulated, what perhaps doesn't? Um, okay, first I'd like to mention that I'm not a policy expert. <laughs> I'm uh, from technical background and uh, specifically uh, working as an engineer previously, mm -hmm. but now obviously going to the dark side of business development. <laughs> um, I think that um, Maybe we, we, we backtrack a little bit on um, the topic of uh, you know, distrust or fear. And it's something which I've read, which is that um, usually we fear or distrust something we don't understand. So with this, um, I think um, there are many ways that we can uh, try to um, promote or help uh, in policy challenges. Um, firstly, what I've seen um, because of my uh, nature of my work, uh, working with uh, governments, uh, not only just in China, but across the world also, um, is that sometimes uh, during implementation, um, they don't understand the end user needs that very clearly. Either that, or they don't understand very specific uh, problems related to the technology very deeply. And so um, it is also, I, 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 I uh, note with interest that actually uh, the company I'm with now, FIOT Open Lab, we are actually, an, if you will, an experiment. We are an experiment into a new type of business 
a model, a new type of collaboration model. Specifically, um, our investors, our uh, shareholders are from the local research institute, the Chinese Academy of Sciences, and also the local government. So with these two um, shareholders, we can then become a very neutral party. So when we try to promote uh, certain industry standards, uh, when we try to do uh, things for the uh, AI, IoT, and big data community, we uh, make representations from a very either technical and neutral uh, um, sort of um, perspective. So uh, in the past, <laughs> when, we, when we first started our organization, there were many companies who, who tried to say, oh, this is a good idea. We, we like a platform that's promoting technology and specifically, you know, very close uh, position, very close to the end user application. We like this. But we, we actually rejected a lot of these, uh, you know, companies because we want to very specifically maintain our neutral party uh, position. So then uh, with this neutral party position, we have actually uh, moved on to help uh, promote and or sometimes pioneer some uh, industry standards, uh, more specifically for IoT, and now moving also towards AIoT. So uh, we participate in a lot of uh, industry uh, alliances uh, and also uh, forums like this. And then we very closely uh, collect all these ideas. And we also bring them uh, back to our shareholders, uh, local governments, and also uh, research institute to help um, progress and, and move, move these uh, difficulties that uh, the end users actually uh, meet uh, during trying to uh, roll out uh, technology. And then we, we tell it to the government, we say, okay, you know, these are the problems that the industry is facing. You know, uh, what policies can you introduce to help uh, either reduce the technical barrier or to help uh, have some, you know, tax policies to promote uh, the growth of these uh, startups or companies. Uh, so this is uh, the work I've done uh, from this uh, FIOT Open Lab site. And then uh, something which is also a little bit more uh, personal to my heart is uh, I'm also the adjunct professor uh, for science education at the Fujian Normal University. Um, I think uh, science and, and technology does not need to be very complicated. We should demystify it and explain it uh, very simply uh, to everyone, not just uh, you know future uh, our K to 12 uh, STEAM uh, kids, but also I think to community at large. Um, I think when AI was first uh, introduced, I think it became very quickly uh, the panacea for all problems of the world. But we know that is not true. And uh, AI, uh, a lot of uh, training and uh, machine learning, which is really um, the, the hard work goes into, into it before you can get really robust uh, algorithms and models. But, um, you know, I think uh, a lot of lay people, like such as uh, my you know, grandparents, my, 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 my parents, they don't know that. And so a lot of people have certain um, I illusions that, oh, the AI is this uh, solution for everything, but it is not. And uh, I think uh, science outreach uh, to our community can also help uh, to reduce um, any misconception and promote better understanding, which I think is the first step towards any uh, good policy making, towards uh, you know, uh, mutual trust. And uh, yeah, that's my sharing. Thank you. Thank you very much. Um, next, I think we'll have Raymond Onua from the Regional Academic Network on IT Policy. And Raymond, if you could uh, still speak to uptake and usage. OK. Uh, with regards to stimulating <coughs> uptake and usage of IoT, big data, and AI applications. Uh, speaking from a developing economy perspective, uh, with a focus on Africa, uh, it's not just important. Uh, before we begin to latch onto the euphoria of technological innovation and the digital revolution, we need to begin to look at the basic analog foundations that are critical uh, to serve as the platform that can help the region harness the potentials 
of these uh, innovative technologies without which uh, we risk amplifying the structural in inequalities that already exist in society between the technology halves and those that do not have. And so for us, uh, especially in the African region, on the demand side, more, uh, more critical, uh, what is most important is to deal with the challenge of digital literacy because people can not use what they don't understand, no matter how, uh, how uh, beautiful the, uh, no matter how beautiful the uh, opportunities look, if they don't understand it, then they can use it. So persistent low, there have been persistent low digital, uh, digital literacy rates across Africa, particularly in the rural areas, while Africa must seem to be a very young, pop uh, young, uh, po young population across the region. In the rural areas, you have a larger proportion of older people who are not digital natives, who, uh, who are less technologically adept than the younger ones and the urban population. So knowledge and ICT skill development will play an important role in understanding these digital services, even when provided in the right language. So we need to improve digital literacy skills through training, integrating uh, digital literacy in curriculars, digital hubs, and information centers, which will be critical for establishing and enabling digital environment where there will be an inclusive uptake and usage of these technologies. On the supply side, critical for, for from my own perspective, is to enhance technology supporting infrastructure, especially with regards to access, not just access, but also affordability, which is a critical component to enabling uh, beneficial access. So internet adoption based on rare access surveys, and also by those done by the GSMS to puts internet penetration across the region at about 24%. So the region accounts for 40% of global population not covered by mobile broadband network, according to the connectivity index of 2019. Even in areas where there are connectivity, the cost of equipment and affordability of services remain a huge barrier to technology adoption with a price to monthly GDP ratio of close to 7% in contrast to a global affordability threshold of 2%, which is a sustainable level. But in contrast to that, the region is operating at close to 7%, which is highly unsustainable. And so there is the need for investment in connectivity infrastructure in, in, uh, from development, which is inextricable from the development of the convergence of these technologies to provide access to robust, ubiquitous, and affordable broadband infrastructure, which will be a, pre a prerequisite for their development and uptake. While in recent years, African countries have made some improvement in the quantity and quality of the telecoms infrastructure, Sub-Saharan Africa still has more to do uh, with regards to adequate and affordable connectivity uh, to put these infrastructures in place. Without these foundations, the potential benefits of these technologies will be limited to and enjoyed by only a privileged few. And on the government side, the most important are not just looking at private-public uh, private uh, partnerships with regards to investment, but I think the most critical thing is to improve ecosystem trust within the technology environment for the government side. Globally, regulators and policymakers are debating what data tech firms should be able to collect and store, the purposes for which they should be able to use that data, the degree of transparency they should provide about what they do with it, the information they should provide the customers on the risk of this data, and even the responsibility of educating customers. And so what is critical in improving this ecosystem trust? We need robust regulatory environments with regards to data privacy and security frameworks that individuals can trust and empowers them to use AI-based solutions uh, that require their data to work. Furthermore, there are important developments globally on antitrust policy and regulation as governments look into these areas to find ways to curb the concentration of data ownership. These are critical imperatives if we are to drive the usage, the uptake of the convergence of these technologies especially across the Africa region. Thank you.
Thank you very much, Raymond. Uh, we have Mike Nelson, uh, another co-facilitator. Um, I think he'll introduce himself. He wants to make a comment. I think you'll hear him, but you might not see him. He's looking pretty dapper as thumbnail. Um, I think it's I'm calling in from Washington, D.C., where it's just uh, before sunrise on Thanksgiving Day. Um, I couldn't join you because I'm starting a new job on Monday and have a lot to take care of before then. Um, thank you very much to Wim and Alex and, and especially TT for the work they've done to pull this together. <clears throat> um, we've got a great panel and I won't talk very long. Just want to build on a few points. Um, I think both of our previous speakers said something very important, which is people fear what they don't understand and they don't use things that they fear and don't understand. Um, so I, I, I think this report is going to help in many ways to address those fears. Um, people who have heard me talk about artificial intelligence and machine learning know that I like to talk about some of the myths of AI. And I think our report and this session are going to address some of these myths. Uh, the most important myth is the, the first myth is that AI is not, is people think AI is magic. Uh, it's not. And, and as a matter of fact, most of the things that people are calling AI today aren't even really AI. Uh, we have to understand this technology is, is limited and it's only as good as the data you feed into it. Um, we also have to understand that it's an evolving technology and that we can't ask it to do everything when it's still at an infant stage in some cases. A second myth is that AI is not just about personal data. Uh, we've had a couple examples today about using AI to forecast disasters or to improve use of wireless spectrum. And I think those are good examples of where we're not collecting personal data. Uh, it's not just about um, Facebook and, and Twitter and the highest level of the stack. And that, that's a third myth is that AI really only applies to content and to data collected about individuals um, in the application layer. Uh, we need to go down the internet stack and think a lot more about what happens at the security layer, the identity layer, and even at the infrastructure layer where we're trying to make the network itself work better. Um, and I think the other, the last myth I just wanted to touch on is that this isn't just about privacy and ethics. Um, it's funny how most of the policy discussion is around those two themes. Probably more than half of all the meetings I've been to in Washington around artificial intelligence start with that question. You know, how do we protect private data? It's incredibly important data, a question. But as the, as the diagram that Alex showed earlier, about the hierarchy of trust that's in our draft report, we need to think about all the different pieces. And so if you look at that graph, the first thing we need to talk about is availability of these systems. If society is going to really rely on them, they have to be available. And then they have to be reliable. They have to be consistent and based on good data so that the result doesn't radically change from day to day and end up misleading policymakers, policemen, individual consumers. There has to be accountability. There has to be security. On top of that, we have to deal with the legal issues around everything from liability to anti-discrimination. On top of that, we have to make sure there's lots of choice because that really will drive the innovation and give consumers choices to make sure that they get the service they really want. And only at the very top level of this hierarchy of needs do we end up addressing privacy and other human rights. And so I, I hope uh, people will read the report and contribute. Well, we've gotten a lot of good case studies here today but there's a lot more work to be done. 
and we look forward to engaging with all of you in the room and anybody else online. Uh, if you have comments for me, the best way to reach me is through Twitter, uh, just Mike Nelson on Twitter, and I've been following with interest what's going on in, uh, in Berlin. Wish I could be there, but uh, I'm here enjoying Turkey and, uh, as I said, getting ready for a new job. Thank you very much. Uh, glad to be uh, able to join in. Uh, thank you very much, Mike. Uh, you're more, more technical than me, so you can mute yourself. Perfect. <laughs> um, so, so next, uh, and I, I think we're going to move on to trust, which is uh, the point that, that Mike ended, and we're going to, to move on to Olive, Olivier uh, from the European Commission, and um, yeah, he, to speak about policy issues related to trust, big data, IoT. Maybe if you allow me just uh, just a few words on the on the first point, which was use and uptake, and I, I very much agree with uh, what uh, the previous speaker said. I very much agree, for example, that uh, um, if we want to stimulate demand, we have to stimulate the supply side. So we need to have the infrastructures in place. We need to stimulate the development of, uh, of technologies. So that's a very important aspect. We need also to stimulate the development of data sets. Uh, so data sets that can be used uh, across sectors or inside one sector to, to um, address uh, uh, large sustainability issues, if you think about the sector of uh, healthcare or if you think about uh, issues related to uh, climate change. Uh, I very much agree also with uh, what my, uh, the previous speaker said about uh, accompanying, explaining AI, IoT, data. I think there is a lot of work to be done in terms of raising the skills, I mean raising the skills for those who develop these technologies of course, but also raising the skills for those who are going to use them, who are going to be confronted with them. So digital literacy, I agree with Raymond, is, is quite, uh, quite important. And maybe um, not everything has to be done by the state. I mean of course education policy is mainly done by states, but initiatives, grassroots initiatives like the one of Emanuela on AI for people uh, are certainly, uh, certainly useful because it's quite complicated to explain what uh, AI does. Uh, another one which is very important, I think, is, is the SMEs. I was at the Web Summit uh, at the beginning of this month. Uh, half of the startups are involving AI or developing AI. So the tech sector, they know about AI, they will use AI. There is no problem. I think the large companies, the administration, they will take time, but they will use these, uh, these technologies. The, the, um, uh, the black spot, if you want, or the, 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 the area where we need to put more effort are SMEs, I think. I mean, they are the ones who need to understand AI, uh, these technologies and need to see how they can incorporate them in their uh, 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 the product development uh, processes. So there is work to be done. And something we do in Europe is called Digital Innovation Hubs. We put in place hubs where we get together academia, large companies, SMEs, so that SMEs learn about the technologies and can, and can implement them. And then an issue which has not been uh, tackled is interoperability. It's very important. I mean, people will not engage in uh, IoT if uh, they know that uh, they will be locked into a solution. So they need to be sure that once they use a solution, it's interoperable with the next generation or the competing product that will, that will reach the market. And it's the same thing with data. Uh, it's very important that data are interoperable. And it's not uh, natively like that. I mean, data is usually done for a specific sector or data is done for human consumption. It's not obvious that this data is, going, is, is easily, easily used by um, uh, artificial intelligence, for example. So interoperability is a quite important question. Now, to come to your point on, uh, on trust, I think, uh, first, we, these systems needs to be, need to be secure. And I think the... The, the, the public at large is well aware that there are security issues linked to IoT, for example. So there is a real effort to be made there to be sure that those connected objects that will surround us, that will support us, are, uh, are, are secure. And think about a connected car. It has to be very secure because you will be driving in the highway, on the highway in a, in a connected uh, uh, vehicle. So you, it, it's better be, sec be secure. And we have done what we have done in, in Europe. We have now a legislative framework about cybersecurity certification. So we believe very much that uh, certification is a very important tool 
to, uh, to increase the level of security, but also to guarantee that uh, product and services on the market are, are secure enough. Um, on AI, uh, trust uh, is very much uh, linked to the fact that we are sure that it will be ethically uh, uh, developed, and that's very much the European line. So we want to develop AI, we want to invest in AI, uh, but we also want to make sure that it is in line with our values. Of course, it will be in line with our values because it will have to f uh, respect a number of uh, our regulatory framework, if you think about our data protection framework, for example. Uh, but now we are thinking with a group of experts about what are the key uh, ethical aspects of AI that we want to be respected. And there are many of them, uh, for example, human agency. Very important that it's not the machine that decides uh, that, I don't know, you are too old to uh, uh, have access to this insur insurance scheme. It's a human being who, who decides these type of things and who can uh, criti uh, look critically at the results of the, of the machine. It's very important to have fairness, non-discrimination inside AI so that you don't, you don't arrive at uh, uh, results which you wouldn't like to, to arrive at. It's very important that these technologies are robust, secure, I just mentioned it, and that they, of course, preserve the, 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 the privacy. When, when coming to privacy, I think uh, something which is important uh, is that beyond the, the rules, it's important to have the technologies to allow people to control their data. So it's very good to have a right. It's very good to have a law that protects, uh, that spells out and protects your right, but it's equally important to have the tools to uh, exercise those, uh, those rights. And that's what we try to do, I mean, um, modestly in my, in my team. We try to develop these privacy and unseek technologies. We try to develop technologies that secure uh, your data, allow, for example, you to uh, manage your, uh, your identity online. So that's, that's a key element, I think, of trust, is that the user is certain that uh, he or she is in control of this um, very pervasive environment we are going to be in uh, uh, already now, but in increasingly more in the, in the future. Um, thank you very much. Uh, next, we have uh, Emanuela from Pop AI, and I believe she has a, a brief presentation. So for, um, before the presentation, which actually is linked to the presentation, I just wanted to add something to what uh, Olivier said for uh, this uh, trust towards AI. So it's this European concept that we are developing, uh, which I, um, I think that it's really probably the key to balance this risk uh, and to, I mean, it's really to, to kind of uh, increase the access to data and, uh, and to benefit from all the, the positive things that, uh, I mean, uh, these new technology are going to bring. And um, a way for uh, developing this, uh, this technology, I think that it could be this CLAIR project. I don't know if you know it. It's, um, CLAIR It's the Confederation of Laboratories for Artificial Intelligence Research uh, in Europe. And I think that it's a very good project because uh, it's, um, it's kind of, I mean, what happens at the moment is that everybody is talking about AI, but we need, I mean, as AI, you need massive data and you need to gather together to develop, to develop a good AI. Like we were talking, like you need to, to develop a good AI, you need good data. But I mean, to develop a good AI, you also need to have uh, like a common base uh, of values, like Olivier said. And I think that this uh, European um, human-centered uh, AI, trust towards AI, is probably, I mean, a good set of values that will help us developing, I mean, a good AI for Europeans and, and for everybody in the world. So um, this is why we, um, I'm part of this CLAIR initiative. This is why we want to build this CLAIR initiative. If you can switch this. Okay, so the next one. Okay. Thanks. Yeah, I'm going to be very quick. So, so these, uh, as I mentioned, I mean, so we can go, just go to the next slide. So the um, the reason why we are uh, we are building this uh, basically this CLAIR network is basically to develop a European AI ecosystem, and I think that this is really important because you don't need only like I mean the government or the researcher or uh, like uh, Olivier was mentioning this. I mean, you need a system, a European ecosystem that then could get I mean a 
worldwide system where everybody is gathering together and we can discuss on how to develop this new technology, how to gather the data, how to use this privacy law because, I mean, it's very important to respect privacy. And really, on one side, uh, as I mentioned, to access, to, I mean, to make, to increase the access to data, and on the other side, to do it while giving benefits to everybody. And I think that in this moment, we, we really need to create like a project like Clara, which is uh, basically, it wants to become something like uh, the CERN did for physics. Clara wants to become the CERN for AI. And I think it's, uh, it's a very interesting project. Um, one last thing that I wanted to say that it's not uh, related to Claire, but it's the, the assessment list, that it's uh, probably something very interesting that uh, it's currently ongoing. It's a test, a pilot test, ongoing uh, on the concept of trustworthy AI. So basically what the, um, the AI group of experts at the European community did is to define this assessment list divided in several areas to identify exactly what does it mean trustworthy AI. So it's uh, um, uh, legal, robust, and ethics. So lawful, uh, ethical from the ethical principle point of view, and uh, robust from the technical point of view. And this is important because I think that uh, we need a kind of a certification for this uh, I mean, intelligent system. I mean, not only European, but uh, probably a global certification to make sure that the decision that are taken, so the impacts on society of this intelligent system is something that uh, is agreed and accepted by everybody so that everybody can understand the way it's developed, it's transparent, it's robust from the technical point of view, and it's static. So probably a good idea would be like to build, a, I think, an international certification for uh, intelligent AI systems. Okay, uh, just an announcement. We are going to go into lunch to make sure that <laughs> the audience gets to participate a bit. I know there's sometimes a uh, yeah, not much chance for the audience, but that is very important at the IGF. So if you'd like to stay, we shall. Um, we're going to move on to the next two speakers, and we have, um, yeah, Evelyn next. Okay, thank you very much. Um, I'm going to continue a bit in the same line of um, values, which was talked about uh, now by Olivia especially, but also speak we just heard. Um, I think if we want trust and uptake of these uh, new di digital technologies, I think, well, the trust and uptake is obviously linked because what we don't trust, we're not going to use. But uh, the, I think that trust really has a lot to do also with ownership in the process. So it means, um, like, how do we actually decide in a way, like, what topics are to be addressed? I mean, that's the... I'm a political science scientist by training, so like that's the agenda setting power, like um, in a way what gets discussed, and I actually have been missing a bit at the, this conference the critical points, and I think it's important to address them, because if we don't address them, we're going to have the problems later. And um, there, of course, everybody's talking about inclusion, but I think... Um, it's maybe also not only who is included, but also like who shapes the debate and who's actually taking the decisions. I think that needs a bit of reflection in a sense of, um, like of course you need inclusion, for instance, of the private sector, but do we really want private corporations to decide about uh, for what purposes, what technologies are used, or would we maybe not want rather um, like elected rep re representatives of the people, means like national parliaments, to decide about these issues. I think there are lots of questions of uh, legitimacy there in a way. So um, I think it's important to also think about topics that were not discussed in that way and like for what purpose we want to use new technologies, for what purpose we do not want to use. That's the thing that has got hardly discussed. Like, I mean, it could be a question, what type of technologies or what type of uses of technologies would we like to ban? And I'm thinking there of autonomous weapon systems, for example. I'm thinking maybe of uh, surveying systems that allows uh, governments or private corporations to collect our data. Maybe we do not want that, but we don't have the opportunity to opt out actively. And that has to do a lot with freedom and with self-determination, with autonomy. And um, when it comes to like justice, something I was really missing as well is that um, it's not only about uh, like this kind of equal access to, to AI and everything, but it's also about the sharing of the risks. Because um, 
like currently everybody is like so much uh, convinced that there's going to be so much great opportunities and I'm also thinking that but not only is not everybody benefiting but some people may be much more at risk than others and I'm thinking there of developing nations or of um, people living in dictatorships who will not have a choice really of how these uh, technologies are going to affect their lives. So I think uh, there's a huge need to also address issues that have not been um, addressed so far. And we're going to go to our next speaker, uh, Bruna Martinez de Santos from Coding Rights. And I think a valuable perspective from civil society. Thank you very much again for the floor. Um, just go, I'm going to go through some of our work a little bit. Um, at Coding Rights, we're starting to develop a feminist framework for, to assess and design AI initiatives. So the idea is to acknowledge that such products and technologies, they should be taking in, into consideration the importance of considering all the critical voices and discriminatory effects that are caused by this. So um, to us, generally, like a lot of those debates about ethics and AI, they have been around um, developing something, but it's something that's upholding a slightly um, global north-oriented approach. So in, 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 this, so in this first like, moment in comments, like, we do think that this whole AI and ethics discussion is lacking a little bit more regional sensitive approaches and also um, somebody or situations that do make companies encompass human rights perspectives and uphold the values as well. Um, also going through um, those systems, we are talking, I, and I'm gonna just pick up a little bit on Michael's, um, Michael's words before, because he spoke a little bit about um, people fearing what they don't understand, and also mentioned the, the need for trustworthiness in those systems and concise databases. But being from Brazil and Latin America, um, and my region being one of the main focus and markets for the defense um, and surveillance industry, I don't really think there is a need or a space for such choice or such like situation because um, Brazil right now is it's starting to implement or becoming more fond of facial recognition systems and, and the application for public safety. And um, we have been using um, drones during Carnival, which is a public party, to identify criminals in a situation that citizens are not informed of we don't have any consent or we don't, we don't, we're not informed or there is no space for consent in such situations. And there is also no debate whatsoever on the amount of invasiveness um, of such initiatives or, or how we are in fact shrinking um, opportunities and shrinking the civic space and a public party in situations in which people don't necessarily um, act as expected. So um, I guess, and just maybe to wrap up this, 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 this short intervention, governments, they come up to us and say that the future is today, as in a mantra for um, when they eagerly want to adopt digital technologies without any consideration of our critical voices and their potential discrimina discriminatory effects. So um, this is what we pretty much have been advocating for back in Brazil. So the need for more information and, and a more... Um, kind of respectful, not to say ethical, but respectful approach to all of it, and, and that encompasses the differences around us. So, thank you. Uh, so we're going to go to Mike Nelson now. Um, Mike, oh, no, Mike says no. I think we should open the floor to the audience. I think that's often neglected at IGFs. Are you an audience member? Hello, my name is Alberto Diaz, uh, co-founder from a startup here in Berlin. We are Hedera Sustainable Solutions, and we deal with uh, personal data in development regions that we collect with cooperation of local institutions. Um, and these are uh, households without the chance to be connected to technology usually. And then the kind of data that we collect is aligned with the sustainable development goals, and the objective is to be able to do impact monitoring for uh, impact uh, investment projects. And then um, in the entire topic of AI, um, my remark is to, 
to underline the fact that AI is not really intelligent. Uh, AI is a tool and is as powerful as the quality of the um, data that is fed into the algorithm. And then um, allowing a machine to make decisions based on statistical uh, conclusions should also address the environment of the data which is collected, not just the actions involved in, in the exercise of commanding uh, a machine to do something, but then what happens in the entire environment, which includes usually um, uh, people and uh, the nature and so on. So um, to, to wrap it up, I would like to say that data should include in and it should be responsibility of the quality of data to also allow the algorithm to draw conclusions, understanding and, and visualizing um, environmental factors um, parallel to the main task that the algorithm is uh, solving. Um, thank you. Could we have uh, another question from the audience? Make it quick, please. Um, yeah, it's more of an inter intervention than question. So, uh, my name is Vasilis. I am a member of uh, a community uh, broadband network and also a co-founder of an environmental monitoring IoT startup uh, from Greece. Um, so, concerning the discussion that we're having here today, I would say that uh, we should definitely look into community broadband networks as um, uh, as communities that can uh, uh, that have connectivity in their DNA, but also uh, digital literacy. So there are a lot of uh, there is a lot of effort going on into educating people and building those skills for uh, local communities that are actually developing their own networks, and these can also be uh, networks of uh, IoT devices and. Um, I would say that these people are uh, very inventive. Uh, IoT today is very accessible. And uh, we have, for example, in our community networks network, we have people who are working with this uh, kind of technologies uh, for agriculture. They want to uh, build tools uh, to monitor their crops. Uh, so this is uh, what they wish to do. We are there to help them build the network, but also help them educate them about these technologies on how to uh, to use them to do what they what they need to do. And um, um, another critical aspect of uh, the whole uh, thing is that um, we should be working with open technologies. For example, uh, uh, in my startup, we are developing a um, um, surface water monitoring system, like water level and uh, quality of the waters. This is um, a project that uh, uh, is built on open source hardware and open source software. Uh, and this allows us to um, actually build a community around this technology, people deploying their own sensors and feeding this uh, data into uh, a platform where uh, then it can be useful for uh, further, um, uh, for further uh, insights and knowledge generation. Um, thank you. Thank you. Uh, and I know that there are probably a lot of other people on the table who are really having great ideas now. Uh, but to avoid that we eat too much in our own lunch break and uh, in other people's lunch break, uh, I really would like to invite uh, additional comments to be made uh, online via email. I mean, if you go even in the schedule, uh, there's a link uh, to where you can find the, uh, the draft document. And there's also an email address there where um, you can post additional examples, additional best practices, and all comments are welcome. And I think that we can uh, allow, like, uh, let's say, a rough week. So if everything you uh, post um, within the week after, let's say, until Sunday uh, evening, the week after IGF, uh, what you post from examples, uh, additional comments, uh, we are still able to include in the report and uh, 
to be taken in, in, in account in this year's uh, work, uh, because that would be, a, I think, a great addition, and uh, then we don't uh, mix up the whole schedule from, uh, from everyone here. So uh, from my side, already very thank you for, uh, for these contributions and for, this, uh, for being here, and then I leave it to Titi to uh, say the final words. Yes, thanks, uh, thanks a lot. Uh, we, we apologize, but the time signed in, so we have to leave the room. So thanks for participating in the session, and we hope you, you will send us more comments and more best practice. Okay, thanks a lot to all. Okay, thank you.